In this video, we're gonna be breaking down uh, how 17 years old uh, Aliriza Firuzia managed to break the 2800 uh, barrier by mainly using the Karokan uh, defense. So, we're gonna be covering some of his uh, best recent games by using this amazing opening. And uh, we're gonna try to kind of see uh, what he prefers to do against any of the big main lines. So, we're gonna see how he decides to deal with the uh, exchange, for instance, we're gonna see what he plays against the classical. Of course, it's gonna be a game uh, about the um, advance. And uh, last but not least, we will be tackling uh, how Alireza likes to play against the two knights because this is also something that uh, we should not uh, underestimate. So, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, feel free to use the line that uh, shows the most uh, interest to you by uh, using the timestamps uh, from the description. So without further introduction, let's just jump uh, right into the action. So in the first game, Alireza is playing against uh, Ariantari in the Stavanger Norway Chess uh, 2020. And I decided to start with this game because it's the most brutal one. And uh, I know you may be expecting that uh, this happens from, let's say, something like the advance where the play could spice up pretty early on, maybe with some kind of g5 moves. But uh, yeah, allow me to introduce you to a pretty wild version to deal with the exchange. I know. How can you actually ever get a brutal game out of the exchange variation, you may be wondering, which most of the time just uh, ends up uh, being like a direct transposition to the London system, which uh, most of you guys really think it's boring. Not me, okay? That has nothing to do with my opinion. But I see this all over the place. So, white goes ed5. Uh, we go c takes uh, back on d5, keeping the pawn into the center. And now the most uh, accurate way of playing for white is to develop the light squad bishop. Now, Ariza goes for knight f6, which is also very interesting to see. This is what uh, Vincent Keimer does quite a lot as his uh, main weapon. Um, in case you missed that video, uh, make sure to um, check it out after this one, because this is really taking over as the uh, modern main line. So what's the point with knight f6? You may be wondering, okay, what is going to play c3? And then black is just like sort of transposing knight c6. It doesn't really matter which knight do you start with. So. This is definitely playable and leading to other lines, but the point is to follow it up with an early bishop to g4. And now white went for queen to b3. And here the tricky part is that we're going to be playing the move queen to c7. And we're not only protecting the b7 pawn, but we're also stopping uh, white from playing bishop to f4. I mean, just think about it. If they are going for the somewhat uh, tricky approach of playing bishop to f4 anyways, saying that, okay, white is now taking, winning the rook, do not forget about the checkmate in one. And now white has uh, no moves. So for this reason, bishop f4 is no longer working. And in this position, uh, white has many moves. Against knight e2, preparing bishop f4, gaining a tempo. We just like to take and play e6, bishop d6, and we saw a very nice uh, win by uh, Vincent Keimer from uh, this position. However, in this game, Ariantari, who is, by the way, one of the best prepared uh, e4 players out there, goes for h3. And now, I think we already mentioned into the Vincent Keimer video that uh, I'm like a huge fan of just going back to h5, g4, and then bishop to g6. And kind of debating white in going aggressive, playing g5, collecting the d5 pawn. This is something that uh, they kind of do nowadays. Because I'm a huge fan of black's positions after knight c6, uh, long castle e5. With, I think, a lot of compensation for the sacrifice pawn. Because simply, uh, white has overextended a little bit too much uh, on the king side, in my opinion. However, Ali Reza has uh, a different plan in mind. After h3, he goes for bishop to d7, which is a little bit surprising, but still, uh, I think, quite interesting. Uh, I think the main idea of this is, in case of uh, something like, uh, let's say, knight e2, my guess is that he will be trying to uh, meet bishop to f4 by going for the early e5. This is usually how you uh, combine this bishop to d7 idea. And let's say after something like knight takes, 
taking on e5 would not really be such a great option as uh, the pawn on b7 is a little bit poisoned since uh, rook b8 followed by rook takes on b2 will uh, give black a uh, great position so uh instead of this in the game arian tari sticks to what it appears to be one of the best uh, moves uh, and the most natural one by far simply playing uh, knight to f3 now we see knight to c6 by black short castle and a move that may look a little bit ugly at first which is e6 and you're gonna be like wait what is this are we just gonna play some kind of crappy french defense right now i don't like my bad bishop i know that will be a reaction of most of you but this is actually not as bad as it looks and it's actually uh leading to a very interesting idea as we will see so what went for rookie one and i know you may be wondering wait but how do we deal with bishop to g5 well you just have to be a little patient because after rook e1, bishop d6, white please bishop g5 now. And guess what Aliaza does? You'd think, oh, maybe he drops the bishop back and protects it. But no, he simply reacts to bishop to g5 by being the ultimate sigma male and castling. Simply not caring about it at all. And you may be wondering, well, as a bishop takes on f6, pawn takes just creating a terrible weakness to our king. And... This may look like that at first, but after 92, it's actually the white king that may be uh, running under pressure after a very strong king age 8. And let's say if white continues with a move such as rook ac1, c4 ideas, we could play rook g8. We want to double up with rook g7, bring in the other rook, and then potentially we can maneuver this knight all the way to f4, where a lot of pressure against the white king. So bishop takes on f6. Definitely not a problem. Ariantari, of course, does not even grab the knight given the chance and plays the move knight b to d2. Okay, now Ariesa starts playing very interesting by going knight h5, which is, you know, knight on the rim, but preparing knight to f4 ideas, which is definitely very annoying. You may be wondering, okay, but cannot I just simply play g3 and take away that square? Now, the knight move may look a little bit dumb. And in fact, this would be a big mistake because there is h6, bishop has to drop. Bishop a4, there's always like g5 as an idea. And on bishop to e3, there is simply f5. Very strong move, f4 next, simply dismantling uh, white's king side. And uh, black is close to winning already. So, after knight h5, we see queen to d1 played in the game. And... Even though knight f4 is a move, uh, Lireza starts with uh, f6, hitting the bishop. Bishop to a3 and now uh, knight to f4, gaining a tempo against the light squared bishop and bishop to f1. Definitely, I think, a little bit of a risky move. To me, it would have been a little bit easier for him to follow up with bishop takes on f4. Even though black still has interesting ideas similar to what we've seen in the game. Uh, with uh, king h8 and then pawn to g5. But definitely, I think position should be around uh, equal. So, in the game, bishop to f1 was played. A bit of a more, like, uh, passive continuation. And now Arias just uh, goes for the attack. He goes g5. I know. You you are wondering, how on earth can we get a brutal game out of the exchange? Well, here is your answer. Just go g5. f6, g5. Just break all the rules of chess and get a winning position. Well... It's not really as simple as that, but in fact, uh, white doesn't really have uh, that much to do in order to punish us, since f6 is controlling the most important square on the board, e5, and there is very little counterplay that white has. Mainly, the only pawn break is c4, which actually Arian just plays right now. We see king to h8, making room for the rook, and now uh, rook to c1 gets played, rook g8, and we see bishop takes on f4, finally eliminating the annoying knight. But then my question is, why wouldn't you eliminate it in the first place and you have to retreat with the bishop? But, I mean, really ignore me. I don't really understand what I'm talking about. So let's just continue with the game. Uh, white goes b4 now, which is perhaps a very interesting move. Idea being that, uh, well, knight takes on b4, c takes on d5. It's a double attack and... White is uh, taking over the initiative, so of course Alireza doesn't take uh, such bait and uh, just plays the move queen to d6. Now, really threatening to take on b4 since there is no longer a discovery incoming. 
White goes uh, b5, hitting the knight. Knight goes to e7, preparing to uh, reroute it towards the king side. And uh, white tries to expand and gain a little bit of counterplay with c5. Queen simply steps back to c7, so keeping the rooks um, connected. And after the move to g3, here is, I think, already where the um, critical moment uh, begins. Maybe this could be the first time uh, you should uh, pause the video and maybe think of uh, what should you uh, play as black because Aliza just uh, takes the initiative and, yeah, the most uh, precise uh, fashion. And uh, he does that not by taking on g3, which I know may look very tempting, but by playing g4 first. Main point being, okay, we cannot take the bishop because gf, queen comes next, and uh, black is kind of winning. Now I took uh, the pawn, and now simply rook takes on g4. Opening up the file, and bishop takes on g3 already starts uh, looking quite terrifying. We see bishop to h3, rook to g7, king to h1, and uh, in this position already black has a number of uh, tempting moves, but he sticks to e5 which is definitely quite interesting, uh, expanding in the center and hitting the bishop. Now, I did a little bit of analysis with the computer in this position, and I figured out that uh, bishop takes on g3 was also leading to a winning position, which is not really that surprising. After pawn takes, queen takes, hitting the bishop, knight to g1 defending, uh, knight to f5 turns out to be very strong, you cannot really take it because that allows mate on g2, and after queen f3, we can simply keep the queens on, where uh, ideas such as maybe simply rook g3, rook a g8, also knight g3 check is an idea. And uh, well, for one piece, definitely black has uh, too much attacking pieces around the king. So uh, instead of this, we see the move e5 in the game. Bishop takes on d7, bishop trade. And now knight back onto h2, threatening to take the bishop, which uh, you'd think uh, Ali Reza would uh, yeah, take care of it. And he actually does by playing queen h3, since now taking the bishop is not really that attractive, since that would just allow checkmate in one. White goes rook to g1, and now uh, black goes rook a to g8. Once again, similar uh, motive here. If you take the bishop, then uh, there is going to be just uh, rook takes on g1, winning the queen. We see queen to e2 in the game, and uh, now, again, Alirza is simply chilling, going for uh, pawn to... Uh, e4, you cannot take the bishop since uh, there will be rook g2 this time, and uh, there is no way to mm, defend uh, against the threat of taking the knight. White tried to move rook to c3, and now simply knight f5 is just a brilliant move that's hitting the d4 pawn and just saying, okay, your pieces are paralyzed, I'm just ready to take your free pawn, take on d2, Play knight f3 next and uh, just cash in the win without doing any fancy tactics. So white felt the need to sacrifice the knight, hoping for some counterplay, but of the simple move. D takes on e4, queen takes on e4, and now finally, uh, yeah, Aliza is sealing the deal by uh, playing the move bishop takes on g3. Now, there's obviously some simple calculation to be done after fg. Knight takes on g3, rook takes, rook takes, rook takes, queen takes. We are up on exchange, plus the enemy king is uh, very weak. So, of course, this is um, simply losing. In the game, rook g2 was tried, but um, after rook e7, hitting the queen, switching towards the uh, open uh, file, rook uh, g2 e8 was enough to force uh, resignation in this position since rook e1 is an unstoppable threat. And uh, yeah, that was simply... Uh, Crushing victory by black against uh, one of the most harmless uh, continuations, uh, which is the uh, exchange. So keep in mind this little idea, play knight f6, bishop g4, and uh, perhaps uh, you uh, could give uh, yeah, this twist uh, that Alireza does by playing bishop to d7 instead of going for the bishop to h5, which is the main choice of uh, Vincent Keimer. Now... The following game is perhaps the craziest games that I've seen in a while. And uh, it happens between uh, Victor Erdos, one of my uh, good friends that I was able to uh, meet during the Romanian league. He was one of my teammates playing on the first board. And he's a very nice guy, very strong uh, player, 2600, I mean 2650 kind of guy at his peak. 
super, uh, yeah, let's say theoretical uh, player, and he does open it up with e4 and uh, decides to go for two knights against Alireza. And by the way, this game is played in the uh, European Championship in 2021, where Alireza just played like an absolute beast, just scoring one win after the other, and this is going to be one of them. And um, you're going to see that quite a lot of the times Alireza goes for bishop to g4 against the two knights, which is not really something that uh, Vincent Kaimo does so frequently. Of course, he like played it um occasionally but uh, i definitely see bishop to g4 as being uh way more common for Firuzia yeah. against the two knights now uh, white goes for h3 and bishop takes on f3 is uh by far the most uh, common move in the position bishop h5 is uh, also seen uh, occasionally but is known to be uh, a little dubious see bishop takes queen takes and now e6 white goes for uh d4 so definitely very central approach. And now we see the move knight f6, which is definitely making it a little bit tricky for white to play. Since if you go for e5, then that just looks like an amazing French for black with c5, knight c6 coming and we don't have the bad bishop. And if you play uh, bishop to d3, which is the most common move and uh, the most natural one, the point is d4 followed by queen takes on d4 and uh, black wins a pawn. Now, According to the computer, this should be um, obviously very drawish, very dull. White is not worse. They have enough compensation for the opponent. Uh, it's known to be kind of a relatively well-known uh, draw. And of course, white is not really interested in such things so early on in the game and plays the fighting approach. Goes for e takes on d5. Now, we see the move uh, c takes on d5. Obviously, there is not uh, much point in taking with the e pawn and trying to play like a reversed, uh, I mean, not a reverse, but like uh, transposing back into the exchange French while uh, you already uh, lost the bishop pair. So c takes d5 obviously is better, just making room to develop the knight. We see bishop to d3 by white and now knight to c6, knight to e2. Preparing the typical uh, c3 idea, the knight was already best uh, misplaced on c3 it's really well known for this structure that the pawn belongs there and uh, yeah by the way this is a very common like knight that you see in lower rated games of course not the case here because with white there is a super strong player but uh, i'm just saying normally low rated opponents won't really read out uh, the knight in such positions and uh we see knight e2 and definitely something very tempting here would be knight to b4 okay if you could just uh of course, uh, something like this, winning the enemy light squared bishop, this is just equalizing on the spot. But of course, bishop b5 now is a little bit annoying. So that's why it did not uh, get played in the game. Now, bishop to d6 is also a move with the idea that on c3 you play h6 and it's not uh, so easy to develop the dark squared bishop. However, in the game we see the move h6, which is super similar and uh, yeah. I really like it. Definitely stopping bishop g5 and uh, saying, okay, if you want to play bishop f4, go ahead. I'm going to play bishop d6, exchange your bishop. And uh, really the only asset that white has in this type of positions is the bishop pair. If you get to trade these, I think black has quite an easy time uh, equalizing. As long as white is able to keep the bishop pair, it can definitely be a little bit annoying, let's say long term. So um, c3 gets played. We see bishop to d6. Bishop to c2, just a sort of a prophylactic move in case, uh, you know, black is preparing e5, d5, knight takes on e5, and this could potentially yeah, become really active. So that's why we see bishop to c2, rook to c8, and now uh, white goes for g4. And already at this point, it is not uh, so simple how to get castle because we already moved uh, the uh, rook to the c5, meaning that there is no way we can long castle. And also, if we castle short, I mean, white already is uh, ready to push these pawns, uh, combined with, let's say, these two monster bishops that are looking towards our king, this would definitely be quite scary. And uh, yeah, here maybe you can try to pause the video, uh, put yourself in uh, Alireza's shoes and uh, try to find a safe place for the king. And uh, yeah, assuming you did... Uh, he simply goes for a walk by playing the move king d7, which at the time I saw this move, I was really stunned, okay? I was like, wait, 
how can something like this work? I mean, this is clearly an opening that I even remember watching this game live while it got played. And to me, it was a sign that, okay, opening went wrong for Black. He's trying to kind of limit the damage a little bit and get his king to safety. And okay, definitely, I think this is the signal that we're about to have a crazy game. So uh, make sure to stay tuned till the end. But uh, yeah, well... I can already tell it's going to be a very double-edged uh, encounter. In the game, we see the move g5. Now, I was actually wondering, okay, what if, let's say, why just go for the most obvious h4 and g5? Isn't this, like, simply giving a big advantage? But, however, this is just, uh, I think, leading to a somewhat uh, balanced position after something like knight d7. Let's say bishop to a3, king to b8, uh, castle, and then knight b6. Ideas to play knight c4, like, hardly has any weaknesses, and I think... The game uh, will most likely end in a draw from this position. So, h4 not really doing the job. And uh, perhaps for this reason, uh, Victor uh, Erdos felt the need to play a bit faster and just went for g5 right away. We see pawn takes on g5, bishop takes on g5, and now king c7. And what basically this is inviting, and of course, nobody like as strong as Victor Erdos will do this, but... It's actually quite a common mistake that I feel may happen in uh, lower rated games. Black would love to see the move bishop takes on f f6. Because, yes, we do get the double pawns, but uh, we get also rid of maybe the most important piece that white had, the dark square bishop. And uh, the main reason why I'm saying that is because now the really main plan is to fight for the e5 square. Now that's fully in our control. Plus, there is a weak pawn on h3. So can definitely double up our rooks, maybe play f5, most likely just win the uh, h1. So, of course, this uh, did not get played in the game. And, uh, well, let's just watch how this continued. We see long castle by uh, white, king to b8, and, uh, yeah, white goes uh, rook d to g1. And at this point, after seeing such a wild king onto d7, when it's finally reaching b8, uh, let's say my anxiety is coming back to like uh, normal levels. I feel like the king is sort of safe on uh, b8 right now. But guess what? Uh, Alireza does on the next move. He just plays b5. Look at this. This is absolutely nuts. I mean, honestly, if I would be watching a game of my student that plays this move, I would be like, okay, king d7 is the worst move that I may have possibly seen in a while. And then... After he gets the king to beat, if he plays b5, I'm going to be like, dude, you simply don't understand anything about this game. Please quit chess or quit the Karo Khan. Just this does not make any sense. I want a break, okay? I cannot be looking at this game anymore. But you know, if I know that uh, with the black pieces, there is Ariza Firuzia. I mean, I'm looking at it. Oh, maybe king d7 is interesting. I mean, maybe this is actually not that bad. Maybe we don't really understand the game of chess. Especially when he plays b5, I'm like absolutely stunned. And still, I have no idea, as we're speaking, whether this was good or not. But, um, I mean, I guess we can just look how the game continued and we can try to draw more conclusions at the end. So, we see b5. What this does, basically saying, okay, king will be relatively safe uh, in the corner. We can play b4, try to create a weakness and... Make use of this uh, rook onto the c file. Now, white plays a3, trying to slow that down a little. We see a5. Of course, Ariza no coming back. Just, uh, you know, doing his thing, pushing on the queen side. Plays queen b6, protecting the pawn. And, okay, as white, it's a very kind of weird spot to be in since you've got, like, all of your pieces on the uh, king side, but they are not really threatening anything while black is already initiating some... Uh, attacking ideas here like we have bishop knight rook uh, queen and b4 ready to be played so this may look a bit scary now bishop takes on f6 was played which was definitely not a must but uh was white's choice you see pawn takes on f6 and now rook g7 black simply defends the uh, pawn on f7 with this move and uh, now we see rook to g1 and finally now that there is no threat by white we can continue our own play with uh, b4 white tried to um yeah, just uh, limit the damage a little bit by playing uh, a4. Bishop to f8, hitting the rook. 
And uh, well, the following moves are not really perfect play by both sides, but I think still the game remains very interesting and we can just quickly see how things go. We see f5, threatening to take the rook, interrupting the uh, queen's defending it. And after this trade, rook to g3, rook back uh, onto the c file. The action is uh, on c3 pawn. Uh, okay, white is just trying to run away uh, with the king now that uh, he felt like, uh, you know, things were getting a little bit dirty over there. Uh, the king is reaching for safety. Uh, we see black opening up the b file, uh, playing knight to e7, and after king f1, time to, let's say, improve uh, our own king. We see rook to g1. That's just, I think, making room to play like king g2. Queen to e6 now. Which I think is already, uh, yeah, sort of forcing the game into a direction where uh, Black really mm, likes to have it because we've got a very interesting endgame, which I think may look quite uh, double edged at first, but in my opinion, I think there's a pretty easy way to understand who is better and, uh, and why. And I know many of you may be tempted to say that Black is better because he's higher rated. Well, Indeed, that's uh, a lot of the times a pretty smart way to figure out what's going on in chess. But I think, um, yeah, like the educated guess would be to simply figure out, okay, black has one, two pawn islands, while white has uh, one, two, three, four pawn islands. So what this kind of pawn islands concept does, it's sort of telling you that the pawns cannot really defend each other. Therefore, they're going to be weaker and black could potentially be switching from uh, a target to the other uh, more, you know, easier than white. So, of course, something to keep in mind is that we have opposite colored bishops uh, on the board, which is definitely going to be increasing the tendencies of a draw. So, like, for instance, if we take bishops off the board and we've got this end game with uh, rooks and knights, I think that's just uh, in black's favor. I mean, put the king from a6 on f6, and that's definitely much better for black. Um, if you exchange bishops, then, of course, like, white can maybe try to infiltrate. But anyways, I feel like maybe I'm going a little bit too much in depth with this uh, endgame. So, uh, yeah, let's just see how it gets played. So, white goes bishop to d3, checking king a7, and now bishop to b5, and... Uh, I think this is a very uh, another very good moment to pause the video, try to find uh, Black's uh, idea because, well, it's not really winning material or anything like that, but I think it's a very interesting maneuver. And uh, he went for the move knight to g8, which may look super weird to a lot of you, but the guy has a point. He wants to just bring the knight to e4, hitting the main weakness that white has, which is the c3 pawn. And here, white went for rook g3. To be honest, couldn't really understand why he did not play the move f3, just sort of stopping any knight e4 ideas. And this looks like um, a defensible position since uh, bishop to d2 takes on c3 is not such a huge threat in a lot of lines. Uh, because, uh, well, let's actually look at it a little bit. I looked at it uh, before, but I was think thinking something like this. Bishop takes on c3 and then this is simply losing because um, the knight drops. So it's not easy to like take that pawn at all. And I think f3 would have been the easiest way to defend this position, but you also have to keep in mind that both players were probably close to a time scramble since they are approaching move 40 very soon. Now rook g3 was played, knight f6, rook d3, and now knight e4. And already white's position becomes critical. My guess is that uh, white, from uh, calculating this position from far away, missed the fact that after f3, now that is knight d6, which is just trapping uh, the enemy bishop. And main point is that black is getting a slowly winning endgame after something like bishop g5, um, stopping the h pawn, bringing the bishop to e7, advancing the pawn to a3, and then maybe just, uh, yeah, playing a2 or, yeah, something like this, play a2, win the b5 pawn, and uh, slowly the endgame is winning without much counterplay for white at all. And therefore, he had to make this sad decision of playing rook c1, I mean rook d1, which just, uh, which just drops the c3 pawn. C rook takes on c3, bishop to e8, and uh, of course, time to protect the pawn. White tries uh, h4, we see king b7, check king to c8. The king is uh, getting ready to approach the bishop very soon. First, we hit the isolated pawn on d4, and uh, in this position, after king to uh, e2, 
Arias starts with uh, king to d8. Now, if you take on d4 first, then uh, the point is h6 becomes uh, a little bit too annoying and the pawn is just getting um, yeah, too much counter play. So for this reason, he does postpone this decision, which already to figure this out during the game is definitely more than impressive. I cannot really express how well the send game was played by uh, by Black. But let's watch out together. So White goes for the check, king e7, uh, bishop to b5, and now king to f6. Once again, there is no rush with uh, taking since h6, h7 becomes very annoying. See king f6, instead, king to d3, and uh, Black is approaching the only danger in the position, the h1. We see rook 8, Black takes. Now uh, White takes the 8 pawn, trying to make counterplay on the other side of the board. Uh, we see king to g4, and by the way, keep in mind that most often, if we trade rooks in these type of situations, uh, the presence of opposite colored bishops will uh, lead to a draw in any game. Now, rook to a6 happens, king to f3. You can clearly notice that the black king is much more active, which really gives him the initiative. And after rook c6, uh, rook to b7 gets played. Of course, trading is just a draw, as I explained it earlier. The pawn is just creating way too much counterplay, and then the bishop e8, f7 idea, it's just winning way too many pawns. So Adirza keeps the rooks. Now I think we have the decisive mistake uh, by uh, by White. But again, maybe you can pause the video here and find a winning idea because I'm telling you, this is not easy. This is absolutely stunning to me that Black is simply winning after the following maneuver, which is Bishop to F6. And I know this just looks like another random move. And a lot of you may be thinking, okay, it's just preparing bishop h4, bishop takes. But that would allow a lot of counterplay with the a pawn. So the fact that he plays bishop f6, it's more impressive because it's preparing bishop a5 and then bishop e1. And the bishop's actually also controlling the pawn while threatening to win f2, which is absolutely stunning to me. Instead of this, white was supposed to play rook d6, I think. And uh, to be honest, I think the following position should definitely be a draw. I mean, white's just getting way too much play with the bishops and... It's kind of a pity for uh, white not to find it. But after rook to c2, bishop f6, yeah. Black never really let him off the hook and uh, the end game was uh, easily winning. White tried this trick with uh, rook takes on d5, but simply uh, missed intermediate move. White has to move the king and then black is ready to pick up the rook uh, with a winning position. So uh, yeah, that was an absolutely... Wild game. I remember it all started with an early king march on uh, move 12, king d7. Maybe the craziest uh, king march that I've ever seen. And uh, on top of this, the craziest part was that black simply played b5 after reaching the b8 square. So yeah, hope you guys uh, enjoy the game. And uh, I think with that being said, we can move on to the next one. Now, before we jump into the third game, if you're really enjoying the content, uh, please consider liking the video because that... Uh, really helps the algorithm push it to more people and uh yeah without further interruption in this game we're gonna witness the classical variation which uh, happened in the game between uh, Jan Shishtov Duda one of the uh, best player nowadays obviously with a rating of uh, 2757 uh, and uh, Ali Reza goes for d takes on e4 followed by bishop to f5 which is definitely well established uh, mainline. It's something that I played uh, myself quite a bit as well. Even though nowadays I'm uh, more of a fan of uh, going for the knight f6 idea, just uh, going for the tatakur. I feel like it's definitely easier to pick up, especially for beginners. So um, yeah, if you're interested to um, yeah learn more about this opening, make sure to check out the rating climb that I did with the Karo Khan because there we're focusing on the knight f6 move. However, there is obviously nothing wrong with uh, bishop to f5. Now, white goes for the main line, just going knight g3, hitting the bishop, and then h4, h6, knight f3. Black sticks to very standard play, going knight d7, stopping uh, white from playing knight e5. Here e6 is another interesting line that I played uh, myself quite a bit with the idea to allow knight e5 and then try to exchange it with knight e7. And in the case of uh, f4, there are a lot of interesting lines where uh, you can think about playing bishop e7 trying to win the h4 pawn. But of course, Alirza sticks to uh, yeah, the most uh, common move. We see h5, now a bishop trade, 
basically everybody knows uh, how this line starts even since i was like 10 years old uh, everybody would play this as a chess club as white and your bishop d2 followed by long castle and this is kind of where the uh, main theory starts black has many ways of doing this uh, like a5 interesting sideline and um, so on but we see simply bishop to e7 king to b1 by white and now uh, we see black castling queen to b6 knight e4 uh, rook to d8 also deserves uh, attention with c5 ideas this is another like very sound uh, setup for uh, black mm, quite popular nowadays but here we see the let's say good old main line with short castle and after knight to e4 uh, we actually see the second most popular move which is c5 the guys are still uh, obviously quite well uh, booked up the main um, let's say move in terms of popularity would have been knight x followed by knight f6 and then queen d5 and in this position white definitely has many tries like uh, knight e5 bishop e3 c4 and so on but um, in the game we do get uh, c5 and now uh, white goes for bishop to e3 which is again not the most uh, common move but definitely a playable line g4 is kind of uh, known to lead to a first draw after knight g4 queen e2 and then queen b6 knight e5 knight takes pawn takes and now f5 is a strong move that's gonna be the end passant and the line continues for 10 more moves but uh yeah i don't really want to make it super confusing but you can take my word that this is gonna lead to a first uh, draw pretty soon and also knight takes on f6 is a move but i think bishop takes on f6 perhaps is the simplest and after d5 i quite like c4 with the idea to transpose into yeah pretty even end game i would say so um yeah going back to what happened in the game we do see the move bishop to e3 and after that we see knight trade followed by knight f6 which is obviously a pawn sack which uh yeah quite surprisingly jan shishtov uh goes for and this definitely looks uh, super scary for white. Even till this moment, I'm not super sure whether this is uh, a position that Jan Shishtov had in mind before the game, or he simply uh, kind of found himself a little bit surprised and tried to refute it over the board. I am not really sure how and what made him go for this. Um, knight to d5 by black, simply preparing to play uh, rook to b8, followed by knight c3 ideas uh, using the pin uh, along the b file we see queen to a6 and now rook to b8 which is by far the most natural move and uh yeah i think what everybody would play going for the fork but it's actually a mistake and what makes it even more surprising is that uh jan Shishtov does not punish this mistake and he just plays the move bishop to d2 which is very common now surprisingly the way to punish this mistake would have been to go for d takes on c5 which i know looks completely crazy because it's just stepping right into the fork but after king c1 rotating the rook white is down an exchange but he's basically saying all right i've got a pretty annoying passed pawn rook d7 is like a big threat and if you play bishop f6 hitting the b2 pawn there is simply c3 shutting down the bishop if you want to trade rooks then white is fine trading and playing queen to b7 and definitely the pawn is super annoying like just think about it you can enter a, an end game like this but after rook d8 bishop takes rook b7 i mean you can simply play bishop anywhere and uh with knight and two pawns like three connected passers definitely white has quite a risk-free initiative in this end game so um yeah Jan Shishtov simply does not uh enter this line which makes it a bit surprising but Perhaps uh, solidifying my impression that he simply was not really expecting this opening and uh, was a bit surprised. Because if he would have like really tried to reach this position, my guess is that he would have uh, found this uh, idea to refute rook b8. Now, instead of rook b8, a bit more precise would have simply been queen c7 and uh, this position would simply be uh, around even after uh, e4 with chances for uh, both sides. But um, in the game, we see rook b8 and then bishop to d2. And now black just getting a uh, crazy initiative after bishop to f6. Obviously, knight c6 is just losing after rook b2 and then queen a8, followed by rook c8. And uh, yeah, white can resign pretty soon. So for this reason, uh, the goal of the knight is 
trying to start up a blockade uh, on the B file, C queen to C7, developing and uh, making room uh, to bring the last piece uh, into the game, C rook E1 and now rook F C8. White now uh, decides to protect the C pawn by playing rook C1. Perhaps the uh, lesser evil would have been C4 and just trying to defend a slightly worse endgame because the pawn on H5 seems to be vulnerable to a lot of ideas like this. But uh, instead we get uh, rook to C1, knight B6, very strong uh, maneuvering uh, idea. Now, you really want to pay attention to this because a lot of people would uh, simply get stuck to the idea that, okay, the knight is so nice on d5, there is absolutely no reason why we should touch it. But think about it, maybe c4 is quite annoying. So knight b6, uh, definitely very flexible and strong. We see knight uh, heading towards c4, teaming up uh, with a bishop against the uh, b2 square. C bishop to f4, creating a bit of an uncomfortable pin. But then queen to b6 is uh, an easy way to deal with that uh, potential double attack and taking with the rook so the bishop is no longer hitting it now you have to keep keep in mind that uh, the b2 pawn is still under attack and after bishop e3 trying to play for another uh, intermediate move rook to b4 was super strong and the main idea of it is that uh, well you may be tempted to think okay this is just like what is black doing self-pinning how dumb this idea could be but there is actually an idea to play knight a3 and then collecting the enemy rook so in fact this is creating a threat which is forcing uh, f3 by white protecting the e4 rook and then uh, a5 gets played because we really need to get rid of uh, this knight from b3 otherwise uh, there is simply no play uh, on the queen side but the good news is that white actually does not have a good way in stopping us from pushing on the queen side since rook b4 is allowing the a4 push that would have been the only a uh, chance to stop that pawn. So in this position, White uh, finds himself in the situation where the exchange uh, sacrifice uh, was required, and now Black simply has a better endgame. However, the way uh, this endgame continued, you're going to see that it was not uh, the uh, smoothest uh, walk in the park ever, but I'll just uh, kind of uh, stop at like the critical moment and highlight like the missed chances for uh, both sides. And... We see a bishop trade, uh, long story short, Alireza does not play the most precise uh, way of all time. And uh, in this position, Jan Shishtov kind of returns the favor by playing the move king to c3. Now, according to the computer, I think on g3 would have been uh, best. And after rook g5 and uh, the following sort of forcing line, um, rook to g3, idea to play e4. Uh, it does seem that uh, after rook to h1, precise move to mid pawn takes with rook f1. White is able to hold uh, equality, and uh, to be honest, I would be kind of terrified as black to deal with these three connected passers, but computer says um, the evaluation should be around zero. But Jan Shishtov uh, misses the chance and plays the move king c3, after which he's like really in a big trouble. Just f4 happened, and uh, then we get to break through with h3, sacrificing the pawn, then another breakthrough with e4, and it's all, uh, yeah, meant to give us the two connected passers that should be deadly. We see an intermediate check and now f3, hitting the knight and uh, after c5. It's actually quite important not to rush with taking. Like this is, I mean, interesting, kind of fine, but you have to think about it, rook g2, rook e2, and then are you so sure you're gonna win against these three connected pass pawns? I mean, computer thinks uh, you're most likely not. So Arias have played this with, uh, yeah, Showing a lot of cold uh, blood here by playing king f7 and then just going f2, getting a queen because the two connected passers on the second rank are just way too strong. Now, uh, also there was a quick point to mention, knight f4 hitting the rook was not really saving because uh, there is simply rook f5, the knight has to move and then same idea as we saw in the game and uh, Aldreza just uh, brings home a big win against uh, Jan Shishtov. So. What I think you can uh, definitely remember after this game is uh, the way he sacrificed the b7 pawn. So definitely in this uh, type of positions, it's more important to have the initiative rather than the pawn. So it's just much better for black to be down a pawn in this position than having a pawn on the b5. So uh, yeah, I think that should be the main uh, takeaway uh, from uh, from this game. Also, I would say in general, in the Karo Khan, when there are opposite castlings, uh, I would say uh, 
like should normally have the initiative from my experience so uh with that being said i think uh we can move on to the last game of the video before we jump uh, right into the last game uh, i just wanted to let you know that uh you could join our discord of the channel with the community so what this allows you to do uh, you get to hang out uh, with people from the channel. We've got like uh, close to 200 uh, members at the time we are uh, recording this. And you can definitely find uh, opponents from uh, similar rating range uh, as yours. Uh, you can like talk about uh, openings, strategy, or share like all kinds of puzzles or memes. You could like get to ask me questions because I'm in there as well. And uh, you can join it for... Yeah, absolutely free. You just need to use the link from the description. So, uh, in the last game, we're actually gonna see an interesting game about uh, the advance. So, as we've seen, Ali is a kind of a mainline guy, very similar to uh, Kaimer in that regard. He plays the move bishop to f5. He's not like goofing around as uh, Magnus did. So, in case you missed the video about uh, Magnus Carlson playing the Karokan. Um, Feel free to check that one out because he's uh, actually uh, showing a lot of interesting sidelines for black. But these youngsters like to stick more with the well-established uh, path. And after knight f3, e6, bishop e2. The difference is that Ali Reza does not go for c5, which is the main choice of uh, Vincent Kaimar. And uh, yeah, if you're interested into the sideline that uh, Magnus played with bishop b4 and then bishop a5 trying to go for the goofy uh bishop c7 97 and then a quick f6 uh which he used to beat anish giri in 23 moves please feel free to check out the video as well if you haven't uh, watched it already i mean probably you did so uh here he goes for 97 yeah instead of Kaimer's c5 and what that actually is meant to do is that if uh, white is castling, then he wants to play c5 now. And you may be wondering, but how does this make any sense to block your bishop first and then play c5? I'm unsubscribing to the channel, I don't like you. Well, before you do that, the point is actually to play uh, knight uh, e to c6 when uh, pawn takes. Because what this does, opening a bishop path, stopping before ideas uh, by white, and well, after bishop e3, we could simply play knight e7. Regaining uh, one of the pawns, and of course, there's like a lot of fury going from this position. Like, white would play c4, and there's definitely a lot of stuff to be aware of. But I'm telling you, this is a pretty healthy line for black. I played it myself uh, as well, and there's definitely quite a lot of move by move stuff to be familiar with. But I think it's definitely uh, worth for long term to study this type of lines. However, uh, Ariantari with the black pieces, he's a big Karokan player himself. I mean, maybe we can even have an episode about his own games. He's a very uh, strong uh, grandmaster, close to 2700, who uh, used to grow up under Magnus Carlsen's wing. So, I can tell you Ariantari plays that line himself with black and tries to avoid it by going for c3. Now, obviously the point is c5, dc5 is not no longer that attractive, like knight e6, there's just b4. So you've got to switch it up a bit. And Ali Reza plays knight g6. We see castles, knight d7. And now knight to e1, which is saying, okay, I may want to go g4 and then the bishop is not having that many squares. Okay, there's like bishop takes on b1, but uh, let's see why I could even maybe play knight d2 next and uh, you're not going to have even that option. And in this position, Ali Reza does something very interesting and pretty hard to explain. He just goes for the move uh, h5, which is obviously a trap. Okay, you cannot take that. It's a poison pawn. Bishop takes on h5, queen h4, drastically turns the game into black's favor. Because after g4, there is bishop takes on g4. If you take it with a queen, only move. It just gives black a much better end game because there is simply a very weak pawn onto the h-file. You can castle long, double up, and just keep attacking that. Of course, white never takes uh, such a bait and just plays bishop e3. Now we see queen to b6, hitting the b2 pawn, and now the move b3. Black strikes in the center with f6, and... We see bishop takes on h5 now. Definitely a bit of a uh, different way of capturing the pawn since the black queen is now committed onto the queen side. Instead of this, pawn takes on f6 was an alternative, but I definitely feel like black would have gotten a lot of activity with bishop d6, knight g4, and long castle. So instead of this, we see bishop takes, f takes e5, and now g4. 
which is definitely, I think, a bit of an inaccuracy. I mean, hard to explain this move, okay? It's it's definitely a very double-edged uh, game ahead. Now, according to the computer, D takes on e5 would have been best, and uh, after bishop c5, uh, trades followed by queen d4. White ends up being uh, with the extra pawn, but I definitely feel like black has decent compensation. Nevertheless, I think white is pushing here. So, uh, instead in the game, Aliasa plays, uh, I mean, uh, Aliasa's opponent <laughs> plays the move g4, which is actually an inaccuracy. And definitely feel free to pause the video here and try to find uh, why. And this is one of the main reasons of why I decided to pick this game for the video. And that is the exchange sacrifice that I find it super instructive. So he goes rook takes on h5 and then knight f4. And what this does, it's basically saying that, okay, I can give up my rook, but he definitely believes in uh, black's uh, long-term chances on the uh, on the king side. So if bishop takes on f4, pawn takes, black could continue with queen d8, queen f6, long castle, bishop d6, rook a8, and uh, definitely a lot of uh, attacking ideas against the enemy king. But when it goes de5, opening up the discovery and the double attack, sorry, here in the knight, we have to throw in the intermezzo and then the game continue with c5. f4, queen to c6, preparing to set up a discovery. You see knight f3 and now long castle. Knight bd2, uh, knight to b6. So black is casually developing, trying to complete uh, um, yeah, development of his pieces and now strikes with uh, d4. Idea being that after cd4, knight d5, not only hitting the bishop, but hitting the f4 pawn more importantly. And after knight c4, we see the uh, knight uh, from uh, d5 capturing the f4 pawn. Bishop takes knight takes, the king uh, steps back. And now, this is the moment where I think Ali Reza missed a big chance to uh, yeah, get a winning position. And I know knight d3 may look uh, very tempting in this position. And uh, that's actually not... Um, Really the best move, sure, you can take the exchange, but it would lead to a somewhat uh, balanced position according to the uh, computer. And in fact, even better than this uh, would have been to play rook takes on d4. And what this does, I know it's like a hard move to play with like so many tempting uh, possibilities, but simple threat is rook d3. And then the knight is very hard to move because you cannot take the rook as there is mate on g2. And best line for the computer is something like 96. And my guess would be that perhaps Alireza missed something like uh, bishop to e4 and in this position knight to g5 is the only winning move. Which is like not the easiest thing to spot if you think about it. Main point being that uh, there is going to be rook g4 that wins the enemy queen. So that is just my guess. I'm not sure what he missed in fact during the game. But um, he plays bishop to g4 which is... Definitely not a bad move, very logical hitting the knight, but uh, definitely missing a good chance. And the game uh, was uh, actually uh, drawn quite soon after rook takes on c5. A lot of crazy moves by uh, both players. And after knight g5, knight to e2, king g2. They actually agreed on to a draw quite suddenly. But according to the engine, best line would have been something like queen d5, uh, bishop to f5, hitting the e4 knight, sacrificing the e2 one. And uh, of course, after some simplifications, we would have reached a pretty um, equal endgame. So uh, yeah, all of a uh, yeah, bit of a, like a unexpected finish to this game, but definitely I think highlighting a lot of interesting uh, ideas in the Caro. So uh, yeah, if you're looking for a reliable setup against uh, the advance, definitely this one uh, that was used by Alireza with 97 intending to meet uh, castles with c5 is uh, definitely a very playable one and uh, yeah it definitely seems that uh, c3 knight g6 is quite a trendy setup so i hope you guys uh, enjoyed this video again if you did make sure to like the video if you haven't already make sure to turn on the bell so you can get notified uh, whenever i release a new video and in case you haven't seen the Karo Khan rating climb yet uh, make sure to click the video that will appear on the screen so thanks again and i'll see you around on the channel take care